you. So as Kai said, I'm a biologist. I'm not a computational person at all. But what I'd like to do today is discuss a problem that was already raised this morning. And that is, how do you capture um, confidence in data and the variation between data generated by different groups? And I don't have the answer to that. I just want to illustrate how we've come across this issue or um, how we're trying to wrestle with this issue in our studies of antisense RNAs. So my group has been studying regulatory RNAs for quite a while, and one category of regulatory RNAs are antisense RNAs. And I'm just here presenting the work. I um, need to mention that really all of the work was done by Maureen Thompson, a graduate student in my lab, together with Cynthia Sharma, who's at the University of Würzburg, and two M bioinformaticians in her group, Conrad Fersner and Thorsten Bischler. Um, they've had help from Alexander Habeck, who's in Kai's group. And it's been very nice for me to meet Kai after sort of indirectly collaborating with her for a while. Um, so antisense RNAs probably have a number of different definitions. I think about them as the transcripts that are encoded opposite a, an mRNA or an RNA of known function. And they can come in a variety of different sizes and um, be encoded in various locations, so they can be pretty small. Um, I should say I w I'm focusing on bacteria, so the problems I will be discussing are relatively simple. We know a lot about E. coli. Um, so you can imagine, I think, the, the issues are much bigger even for eukaryotic organisms. But in bacteria, the antisense RNAs um, can be encoded opposite the 5 prime end of mRNAs. They can be encoded opposite um, internal to the coding sequence or at the 3 prime end. And they can be very long. They can come from another gene located or another promoter located outside of the region of the gene to which they're an antisense RNA. Um, so not that many antisense RNAs have been characterized in terms of functions, but um, a f several functions have been ascribed to antisense RNAs. And it, there have been examples showing that they affect transcription, message stability, or the sense um, RNA stability, and they can affect translation. So they can, just the act of transcribing the antisense RNA can affect transcription of the sense strand. The two RNAs can base pair, and that ha can have implications for the transcription. The base pairing can also block the activity of either an endonuclease or an exonuclease or can stimulate the activities of these enzymes. Um, similarly, the base pairing can block ribosome binding or lead to a change in RNA structure, which can either facilitate or prevent ribosome binding. So clearly, antisense RNAs have regulatory effects. There are examples of antisense um, RNAs having regulatory um, effects. So, my group has been interested in the problem, how many antisense RNAs are there really? In E. coli, how many antisense RNAs are there? And then from that, do all of them have function? How do we figure out which are the most interesting RNAs to pursue in terms of function? How do we get at function? And this, with all the deep sequencing now, you, there's vast amounts of deep sequencing data of the transcriptome. Um, you'd think this problem would be easier than it is. And, and one thing I want to point out is that if you look at the literature for different bacteria, the number of antisense RNAs that are reported, so papers say this, uh, for this organism, there are this many antisense RNAs can vary. So for one study, for a rhizobium species, 2% of all genes. For salmonella, 13% of all genes. For helicobacter, 46% of all genes. Now, 
Do the different bacteria really vary in the number of antisense RNAs that there are? Or is this a consequence of how the data is analyzed or reported? If you just look at E. coli, E. coli has been studied for many years, so a number of people have carried out deep sequencing to examine the transcriptome. And the number of antisense RNAs that are reported just for E. coli can vary significantly from in the tens of antisense RNAs to the thousands of antisense RNAs compared to about 4,000 protein coding genes. Um, the other thing that's kind of striking is that if you compare the antisense RNAs that are reported by the different groups, there's surprisingly little overlap. So all these groups are looking at antisense RNAs, and they're finding 1,000 antisense RNAs, but they aren't all the same. So what are some of the reasons for these differences in the number of antisense RNAs? And how can you capture information about the confidence in the data and variability in data between different groups? Um, so the, I, I don't want to give the impression that I don't think this RNA seq or deep sequencing isn't very valuable. I think it's extremely valuable, and it's been um, it's changed how we think about gene regulation. And I think for maybe 80% of all genes, um, especially mRNAs, the data is very consistent, and, and um, there's a lot of similarity between the, what is reported by different groups. It's the transcripts that maybe are less abundant or that are less well characterized for which there's a lot of variability. And I think one needs to keep in mind that the data needs to be examined when, with some caution. When I look at genome browsers with their pretty colors and their um, peaks, it's very seductive. You forget that this is data that's been analyzed and that there's some error associated with the data. And I think that needs to be captured a little bit better. Um, so, so these are the questions that we would like advice on. How can information about analysis be made easily accessible? in a way that can be used? How can variability and confidence between data sets be displayed or, again, captured most effectively? Um, and so we're, we're studying this very simple problem of E. coli. The approach we have taken is just to ta obtain RNA-seq data for two independent um, cultures, uh, samples grown under three different conditions. We're comparing the data with each other, and we're comparing it with published data. Um, and the approach that we're using is differential RNA-seq. This is an approach pioneered by Cynthia Sharma together with Jörg Vogel. Basically, you're uh, isolating RNA and treating it with a terminator exonuclease which can degrade processed RNA, such as ribosomal RNA, um, but can't um, digest primary transcripts. As a result, by comparing the data sets, the deep sequencing data that you get for the text-treated and the untreated samples, you can see where you get enrichment for primary transcripts. And this allows you to very precisely map promoters. It also gets rid of ribosomal RNA. So we use this approach. Um, we isolated samples for E. coli cells grown in minimal medium to exponential phase and rich media to exponential and stationary phase. The samples were treated um, plus minus text. And here I want to point out something. We first did the first set of data in 2011. And at that time, um, used one set of uh, available primers and um, one version of the Illumina sequencing machine. Now, we repeated the experiment, or we repeated some of the samples. In 2013, by then, the primers and the technology had changed already, improved with true seq primers, Illumina high seq. And we compared the data that we got in 2011 with the data we got in 2013. And, you know, it's not, oh, I should point out, so that 
things have changed. Um, one of the things that's changed is the primers that are attached to the RNA. You, you sequence many different samples in the same batch, so you need a barcode um, in the primers that are ligated to your RNA. It used to be you, the region that was the barcode that had differential sequence was ligated, ligated directly to the RNA. People realized that those barcode sequences could affect the ligation. Now the primers have the barcodes um, in a position where it's not directly ligated to the RNA. But in comparing our data from 2011 to 2013, it's not perfect. This is the correlation uh, coefficient for the, the um, sequence for the genes, looking at the genes. So for some data, the, the correlation coefficient is pretty good. Others, it's not perfect. So even these are the same samples, just analyzed differently in 2000, slightly differently in 2011 and 2013. And if you just look at, you use your genome browser, um, the different colors, this is one growth condition, this is another, this is the third growth condition. In some places, it looks pretty similar. The top lines are always plus text treatment, the other ones are without text treatment. Where in other places, the data looks a little bit similar, uh, less similar. So I think it's just worth sort of considering the different sources of variation and how that could be sort of captured or thought about in analyzing these uh, enormous or extensive deep sequencing data sets. So of course, there's experimental uh, variation, the sample. Even RNA preparation, we have found how a lab prepares the RNA can give you pretty different results, how the sample is treated, whether it's treated with the exonuclease, size uh, fragmented, lots of different ways. The linker ligation, cDNA preparation, the sequencing platform and model, and the depth of sequencing. So these are just the experimental variation. But then there's the uh, other sources of variation, the computational sources of variation, that also, I think, need to be considered. And I just want to provide two examples. But some of the things that um, where variation could be introduced is the mapping, um, quality check, how groups examine the quality of the data, the annotation, the, the sequence against which their data is, is uh, aligned, uh, how they annotate promoters, those sort of things, normalization, quantification, thresholds, can all have an impact on the number of transcripts, for example, that you are considering as an antisense RNA. You know, some group may have their threshold at one point, another group may have a threshold at another um, point. Um, so we took our data, and this is um, Torsten and Conrad, and they used two different uh, mapping programs, Zygamail and Bowtie, which I think are reasonably commonly used, especially Bowtie, but there are at least 51 other short read mapping programs. So there's a whole variety of different mapping programs, and they each have their parameters, and you can use the default parameters, which are uh, the first, third, and fifth uh, lane here, or you could modify the parameters. Here, we took the data from the 16, uh, the, the 12 different sequencing reads and looked at the average in red. These are um, box plots. So you can see the different mapping parameters can give uh, somewhat different values for the percentage of reads aligned. The different mapping programs also um, provide different information about unique align, uh, uniquely aligned reads. So some programs just align a sequence to one position um, in their using their default parameters, whereas that sequence may actually be repeated multiple times. So, um, if one is not aware of all the default parameters that can impact how you're thinking about the data. 
So as another example I want to mention, we are using an automated promoter annotation program developed um, by Alexander Habeck and Kai Nieset. And um, there too, there are some parameters that you can vary. So we, one parameter in this program is looking at the difference between the text treated and the untreated sample, sort of the, the um, sample enriched for the primary transcripts. And if you just vary this enrichment factor, you can say there are either 5,000 promoters in E. coli or there are closer to 3,000 promoters in E. coli. So just by varying this one parameter, you have, um, this can have a, a significant effect on your promoter annotation. Which again, if you are determining antisense RNAs based on your annotation of promoters, can have effects on how many antisense RNAs you um, predict there are. So um, this was just looking at our own data. We've found the problem is even more complicated when you try and pull the data from other groups. As I said, E. coli, the um, transcriptome, has been sequenced multiple times for E. coli. Um, there, there's the problem of the accessibility of the data. Um, where is the data and what kind of form is the data and then what is the quality of the data? Um, Torsten and Conrad took the data from several groups that had published um, about the E. coli transcriptome and you can see uh, the number of reads after quality trimming varies con uh, considerably, the number of mapped reads and the quality of the reads based on several different parameters is also pretty significantly different. So all these things impact on the ability to compare the data sets generated by the different groups. So let me just, um, just illustrate uh, going back to our antisense RNAs. Here is a putative antisense RNA that we detected um, as indicated in the gray tracks, and this was also de detected by the other groups. Um, in contrast, we detect a transcript, an antisense -trans anti transcript here, but there's very little signal for the other groups. So which of these antisense RNAs are real, are both real? What accounts for this difference? So let me just stop here and just reiterate, I think the, anti, the, um, the deep sequencing is extremely powerful, but I think it's worth keeping in mind that data needs to be examined with some caution and variation can be introduced at multiple steps. And um, looking forward as the um, biologist, the lazy biologist, some of the things that I think we would like to have help thinking about is how can parameters and confidence in data best be represented, especially in light of moving technological advances? How can data best be made available? Can all this data be stored? I think this will be a problem going forward. And will some data become obsolete? Should we just throw out the data that we obtained in 2011 because the sequencing technology has improved so much and the primers are better. So at one point do we just throw out data and how do you how do, you, um, do that um, on the basis of a whole community? How can you have some sort of quality control in terms of the data to be analyzed? So thank you very much.